Um, so welcome everyone. And as promised tonight, what we're going to be talking about is um, we're going to look at kind of the aspects of ancient trials that are maybe a little bit less familiar to us and how we see those play out in biblical texts. So I sent you in your handout, um, I had sent you some uh, examples. I, it was hard for me. I have to, I, I will say that there were a lot of texts that I wanted to get my hands on to send to you that I couldn't. Okay, it, it's some of the more interesting uh, trial texts are not rel readily available to me um, right now. So, um, so, but I, I, I think we can use what we have to kind of flesh out um, certain aspects of trials in the ancient world. Uh, I'm going to do another sound check, guys. Everyone can hear me okay? Everyone can see me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, let me make sure my chat is on. Uh, again, you know, if you, uh, any questions, any comments, put them in the chat, and I will get to it when we get to a regular, um, a regular um, pause. All right, so I'm going to, um, um, if we look at, um, let's start, let's start by just talking about some of the basic some of the basic um, aspects of a, how would you decide in the ancient world, how do you decide who is right and who is wrong? Okay, so there are a couple, there are a few kind of basic things. First of all, you have to bring evidence, right? If someone can bring evidence that they're right, then that is important. Uh, second thing is witnesses. If they don't have evidence, they can be, bring witnesses and that will, that will work. And of course, their oaths. Now, oaths for now oaths are um, fill uh, several different functions. They can be sworn at the end of a trial. Just because if you're reading a trial case and people swear, that doesn't mean people are swearing in order to provide evidence. They could be swearing because what they're doing is they're saying, "I accept, I accept that the results of this," and that's what I'm swearing to. I'm swearing to that this is what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, yes, so there's there's the problem of um, Natan Vlad is bringing up the problem of edim zomimim, the problem of uh, witnesses who who um, who mislead, who say something uh, that they're not allowed to, and of course those um, um, those are they are punished. If you have false witnesses, why are false witnesses public punished so severely? Because in fact, someone can be killed because of a false witness. Um, we see that. In, uh, in, in different cases. So if let's actually, let's kind of jump in uh, to, I believe I brought this to you from the Code of Hammurabi. If you look at your source, let me make sure that I have it um, here um, in your source sheets. Uh, yes, so here, um, if you look at your source sheets, page eight in your source sheets, um, that's, uh, it's taken from Pritchard, it's page 166 in Pritchard. Um, so it says, uh, I'm, so I'm reading from, again, page eight in your source sheets, page 166 in Pritchard, uh, law two, okay? If a senor, that's a Wheelam, and we're reading in the, uh, the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, if a senor brought a charge of sorcery against another senor, and when a wheelum brought a charge against a wheelum, but he has not proved it. The one against whom the charge of sorcery was brought upon going to the river shall throw himself into the river. Now, this is an important part of some trials, particularly in old Bab in old Babylonia, um, in old Babylonia, which was if you had no way of proving a case, you could use this river trial. Right where someone has to kind of throw themselves into a river, and if they don't drown, right, then they're apparently right. Okay, either it's just throwing themselves into a river and swimming, or sometimes it may be um, holding up something heavy. Okay, so what we see here in this in this case is he's brought a charge of sorcery against another person, and the only way to know if this guy is he hasn't proven it, right? So he doesn't hasn't brought other witnesses. He hasn't brought some sort of proof that this guy committed sorcery. So the person who's the defendant, he has to throw himself into the river. He has to take the river trial. And if the river has then overpowered him, his accuser shall take over his estate. If the river has shown that the Awilam is innocent and he has accordingly, accordingly come forth safe, the one who brought the charge of sorcery against him shall be put to death. 
while the one who threw himself into the river shall take over the estate of his accuser. So here we see a similar situation where someone is considered a false witness because the guy survived the river trial. And now what was supposed to have been done to the accused sorcerer is instead done to his accuser. Now, now what is a very uncomfortable situation here is that the accuser has a real reason to accuse um, because if he wins, he gets the guy's estate. So that does not seem like a really great way to have justice and to keep false charges from, of sorcery from being stated, right? You would actually create a lot of uh, problems here, one would assume, with a law like this. Uh, it, it's easy to see the sort of the Salem witch trials happening like every day. Um, but of course, the risk is that if you, if the guy can swim, right, <laughs> then you're the one who loses and, and you're going to die and he's going to get your stuff. So that is, apparently is enough of a counter balance or it's considered is considered enough of a counterbalance because as remember the law of Hammurabi was not necessarily applied as it was stated now I'm going to take a pause here and look at some questions um uh Susan Aronoff says no wonder the Gemara says you have to teach your child to swim well certainly much later I would imagine that in old Babylonia that would probably be a smart thing to do, to teach every, to everyone to learn to swim as early as possible, uh, especially women, as it turns out, because that's, of course, one of the ways, that's what happens with the charge of a dog that isn't proven. Um, I believe I brought that for you also in the, in the same source sheet. If you go, if you, yeah, if you um, go to the next page, that's page nine of your handouts, page 171 of Pritchard, uh, law 132 in the Code of Hammurabi, if the finger was pointed at the wife of a senor because of another man, but she has not been caught while lying with the other man, she shall throw herself into the river for the sake of her husband. So she has to take the river trial because her husband brought a charge of adultery or someone brought a charge of adultery. Here it's not clear that it's the husband. Someone brought a charge of adultery and there's no proof. So she takes the river trial to prove her innocence. Uh, what does the woman do in the Bible? She drinks special water, right? She drinks the bitter water. And if her, if her stomach blows up, then she's dead. And if her stomach doesn't blow up, then she's innocent. Okay. So, so it's, it's, it's a situation where someone brings a charge and there's simply no way of knowing who's right. It's a he said, she said situation, situations like that. So you have now in in the biblical case, it's specifically for adultery, because there's a big problem of having a man suspecting his wife of adultery and having no way to resolve it. Right? In general, in in the Bible, you don't have um, you don't have a kind of judgments by trial. Right? Um, um, except maybe you could say that in the case of a prophet, you know, if a prophet's word comes true, then he's a true prophet. If his prophet's word doesn't come true, then he's not a true prophet. Um, that you could say, well, well, that's kind of a proof is in the pudding type of thing. Um, now, Lisa said, I think you said previously that circumstantial evidence isn't accepted. I'm not sure I, I spoke correctly, first of all, because I, I, because circumstance, I, I'm not very good, particularly good with legal terms, right? Evidence is accepted. In other words, um, if you can bring um, physical evidence that proves your case, all right, that is accepted. So, for example, the classic case, as we've we've mentioned it before numerous times because it's a biblical case and a case in our ancient law codes, is if a shepherd is watching the sheep for the owner of the flock and, a, and an animal attacks and kills one of the sheep, right? So he has to bring the sheep's carcass, right, as proof that an animal attacked it. Because if an animal, if a wild animal attacks a sheep, then he's not responsible because what was he supposed to do, do, die to protect the sheep? But he had to be able to bring the torn carcass of the sheep or goat as proof that in fact a wild animal got it. And as we have noted, that seems to be what the brothers are doing with Yosef's coat, saying, here's a coat, it's soaked in blood, Clearly, he was attacked by a wild animal. Therefore, we as his older brothers, who would normally be absolutely responsible for this boy, we are cleared of any, of any uh, responsibility, and Yaakov must accept it because the evidence has been presented to him, even if he doesn't really believe they're innocent. And we know he doesn't really believe they're innocent because he refuses to let Benjamin go alone with them afterwards until there's absolutely no choice. Because he's not so... He's, and he says, what if a disaster happens to Benjamin, right? 
And why should a disaster happen to Benjamin and no one else? And the answer is because he knows what happened to Yosef. Or he, su he strongly suspects, he strongly su suspects something happened. Now, if we, if we take a look, let's take a look as an example from a trial in uh, Mesopotamia from your handouts. Um, so uh, we mentioned this last time, but let's take a look again. Uh, the Goring Ox at Newsy. So that's page three of your handouts. It's page 270 of the Context of Scripture, volume three. Um, I'm going to make mine a little bit bigger here so I can read it. Okay, so the Goring Ox at Newsy. So here we have a situation where someone doesn't have the evidence. So I'm just going to read straight. I'm not going to read the introduction. Tebtila, son of Puhisheni, went to court before the judges against Teya, son of Warat Ahi, saying, Teya, the ox herd of Tebtila, he injured one ox. Said Teya, Okay, his fellow ox injured this ox out on the range. So in other words, this isn't quite a case of wild animals, it's a case of a goring ox. So um, Tebla, who was the owner of the oxen, said that Teya, the oxer, who was responsible for caring for the oxen, said Teya injured this ox. Okay, um, and Teya says, no, one of the other oxen injured the ox. Okay, but the judge said to Teya, bring your witnesses to the effect that his fellow ox injured him on the range. Taya said, my witnesses are not there. The judges said, it is you who injured him. Pay the equivalent of the ox. Teptila won the loss, and the judges ordered Taya to pay one ox out of his own herd or funds. Okay, so what we have here is a case where he didn't have the evidence. Okay, you have a he said, he said situation. There, he could not bring the evidence. The, uh, the, um, um, Base assumption is you are responsible for the oxen. In other words, we have a base rule here, which is that you are responsible for the oxen in your care. If you can't bring evidence that something happened that you could not have prevented, then you're responsible. So the 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 um, the burden of proof lies here on the ox herd. He couldn't bring any evidence, and he couldn't bring witnesses, right? Because that's what everything relies on. It relies on witnesses and evidence, and in some cases, oaths. In some cases, some kind of trial. Uh, some kind of like trial by river, but trial by river is a relatively, it's not, ha it doesn't happen all the time, right? In general, you want to look for evidence. Let's look for a, a case where, in fact, it seems like there is no evidence on either side and there is, but it's not, they don't um, so do something, as a, it's a court case between two people. Um, let me find this in your handout. Um, if we look at, okay, this is on page to go in closer. Um, here we have, um, uh, it's uh, on page five of your handout. It's page, um, what page is it? It doesn't have a page number on it, um, but it's also from context of scripture. Um, so it's page five of your handout. It says model court cases. And model court cases means that these were copied over and over by scribes who had to practice copying over court cases. However, they think they're, it's based on an honest to goodness court case originally, okay? So it's considered an actual court case, even though it's being copied over and over, all right? Um, Ursuena, um, let me make sure that I'm, I'm bringing the right, uh, yes. So Ursuena, son of Elomasu and Anibabdu, his brother by mutual agreement, divided their inheritance by lot. After Ursuena died, 10 years having passed, Anababdu confronted the assembly of Nippur, appeared in court, and declared, One third pound, 20 shekels of silver, the price of two slave girls, Ursuena, my older brother, in no wise whatever gave to me. Abakala, son of Ursuena, appeared in court and declared, His heart was satisfied at that time with that money. In other words, one says, I wasn't paid, the other one says, You were paid. The judges remanded Abakala to the gate of Ninurta for taking the oath. He's going to have to take an oath before God. It isn't really clear here. Is he taking the oath? Is it, a, is it an against perjury? Or he's going to have to take an oath after they decide it? It seems like it's against perjury here. Um, by the gate of Ninurta, each man was made to go towards to accommodate the other. By mutual agreement, Abakala gave four shekels of silver to Anababdu, eight rods of orchard, etc., etc. And then Anababdu swears that he's not going to contest it again. Okay, so here's a case where they really don't know. There's no document, apparently, that, that, they, that they can point to. And so what they say is, okay, guys, compromise. 
right? So that's that's a you would consider a per, pretty reasonable court case. It's what the Israeli courts do all the time. If you've ever been to an Israeli court with these situations, they always say, "Okay, guys, compromise," right? Um, and and that's what's going on here. So it's not like it's not a, it's not a standard. It's not like a kangaroo court. I mean, they there is a ch kind of idea of like, okay, we're not sure, we don't know, guys, let's make a compromise. This is what we can do. Um, um, uh, right above that court case is a court case with adultery where there is, as it were, evidence because she's been caught in the act. Um, um, Ishtar Umi, the daughter of Ili Asu, I'm just reading from the same page, was taken in marriage by Aram Malik. In the first place, she broke into his granary. In the second place, she opened his pots of sesame oil and cut them with cloths. In the third place, he caught her on top of a man. Now, I would have led with that, right? But I don't know. Okay, like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> he bound her on the body of the man in the bed and carried her to the assembly. Okay, in other words, very much like, you know, if you ever know, remember the Greek myth where Aphrodite is with is 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 cheating on Hephaestus, right? So he ties her on the bed with the proof and says, here she is with a guy. She committed adultery. Well, in that case, that's it. She committed adultery. It's very, very clear, right? It, it sounds pretty wild, okay? Uh, this is a model court case. So you don't know, did this really happen or is this something they're just copying over and over and over again as a scribal lesson, right? Uh, you can read what happened to her, which is pretty horrendous, um, shaving parts of her head and uh, nether regions and piercing her nose with an arrow. Um, and note that the king was involved here in, in this case. Uh, the, the king um, was involved here. So there's divorce money um, involved and and also they shamed her. It's interesting, they didn't actually kill her, right? She doesn't, which is what one would kind of expect for adultery, but apparently it's not what she gets. She is, however, publicly shamed. She is uh, permanently kind of scarred. Her nose, nose, nose is pierced with an arrow. Even though it's not clear to me um, um, it's not, it's not clear to me whether, whether that nose piercing would have made her afterwards identifiable. Like, was it, was it that the, the ritual itself of piercing with an arrow was painful and horrible, or was she going to carry a scar afterwards that everyone would be able to see, okay, this woman was guilty of something, but it's pretty horrendous. The whole thing is pretty horrible. Um, and at the same time, she's she's not actually killed, which is what one would expect in an adultery case. And that, again, goes to show that trials don't always match these law codes that we see. Um, um, now, it, and also interesting is, of course, that the king is involved. Now, there there's a wide variety. It's, it's I, 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 I read up, I really read up on it really in preparation for this class more than anything else. And, and it's ama it's interesting how through the ancient Near East, really kings get involved in a variety of different cases. So depending on the place and depending on the period, there are times when kings get involved in fairly minor cases. Um, there are places where kings only get involved really in cases of treason or in cases of land inheritance, because that's supposed to be important to the king. Um, um, and there are... Um, um, and there are places where the king is, and there are places where the king is involved in, in relatively minor issues. Now, uh, uh, Danny and Lily Barkai say it doesn't seem cl clear here whether she was committing adultery or was raped. I, I, there's, it's pretty clear. I mean, I, I mean, that's obviously what you're supposed to understand, right? Um, he caught her on top of a man. That that indicates she's not being raped, right? That 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 wording kind of indicates that it's not a rape here. And it's also the third thing that she's done wrong after, you know, after, you know, um, 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 opening his pots of sesame oil and covering with them with cloth. Like, what if she's done that? Like, what won't this woman do, right? So she's, so this is the third thing she's done wrong. This is what's interesting to me. It's like, this is the third thing. It's like, this, this is just, this is just the straw that broke the camel's back. After breaking into the granary, like, it's like, that is it. Like, I, I already knew you were a bad egg, and this just does it, right? <laughs> so it, it's a weird setup. So it's very hard to know. Again, for me, it's especially hard to know, because scribes, there were scribal exercises that were kind of funny. There were scribal exercises that were meant to be a little bit humorous. So I'm not 100% I'm not sure, you know, what whether this might be, maybe, you know, kind of plays into that. Um, okay, so um, if we, if but any at any rate, so we see that, 
um, there are, you know, there's, there's here, but the idea is that he's bringing real evidence. He caught her in the act, right? So it's not just a, a suspicion. It's not a he said, she said, and that kind of settles it, right? Now, there are absolutely places where, um, where they use reasoning. So let's look at a very, very early court case. Um, and that is a Sumerian court case. Um, and, I, and we're going to look in, in just a bit and see some some biblical trials and see how see what we see in some of these biblical trials in terms of um, we've already talked about the idea of bringing evidence of having to bring evidence when, for example, a sheep in the flock is is killed um, and bringing the actual thing. We have we've already talked about the biblical rule that if there are two witnesses that are false false witnesses, um, they get the punishment, right? That they were meant meant to um, cause to someone else. And we see that in the ancient Near East as well. Um, now, I also want to point, if you if you ever read through the book of Psalms, Tehillim, cover to cover, you will remember that having witnesses fal falsely testifying against you is like this major thing comes up again and again. They're testifying falsely against me. They're saying false things about me. They're testifying falsely against me. And it's a theme, okay? And the part of the reason such a theme is because it's so dangerous and there's so little you can do to defend yourself if there are two witnesses that decide they're going to lie about you, right? What are you going to do in a situation where there's no really great way to investigate? besides relying on witness and looking at actual physical evidence, okay? So um, here, but there are, there is a certain amount of reasoning. So let's look at, I have for you that this should be at the very end of your handout. Um, this is from, this is the source is from the tablets of Sumer. I got it as a secondary source because I wasn't able to get hold of the book, uh, but, I'm, but I, I, I saw it in a couple, so it should, this should be fine. Um, okay, so I'm going to read Nana Sig, the son of Lucin, Ku Enlil, the son of Kunana, the barber, and Enlil Enam, the slave of Adakala, the gardener, killed Lu Inana, the son of Lugal Apindu, the Nishako officials. These three guys killed a pretty important person. After Lu Inana, the son of Lugal Apindu, had been put to death, they told Nindada, the daughter of Lu Ninarta, the wife of Lu Inana, that her husband Lu Inana had been killed. Dada, the daughter of Luninurta, opened not her mouth, her lips remained sealed. Okay, and this is going to be an important point of the case. So you have these three guys. We know these three guys killed him. Apparently, that is clear. They, it, 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 everyone knows these three guys killed this guy. And they told his wife, and she didn't say anything. Since she didn't say anything, is she guilty of murder? That's the main issue that's going to be in the trial. Okay. Um, so is she guilty of murder? Their case was then brought to the city Isin before the king, then, and the king Ur Ninurta ordered their case to be taken up in the assembly of Nippur. So here you say, okay, your majesty, will you, will you try this case? And he's like, no, it should be tried before the city assembly. Okay, so he kind of bumps it back down, right? It's not a king level case, and the assembly is going to take care of it. Um, so who's taking care of it? There, Orgula, son of Lugal, Dudu, the bird hunter. Ali Alati, the dependent, Buzu, the son of Lucin, Aluti, ta ta ta, Shishkala, the porter, Lugal Khan, the gardener, Lugal Azida, the son of Sinandal, and Shishkala, the son of Shara, faced the assembly and said, They who have killed a man are not the of life. Those three males and that woman should be killed in front of the chair of Louis Nana, the son of Lugal Apindu, the Nishako official. Okay, so these, these, the three guys and the wife are all guilty of murder. Okay, and then two other um, members of the assembly, um, of this group, rather, I should say, you, there's, they're, what they're doing is you have this group, and one group is saying they should be killed, and then there's other, this other, other two people also argue in front of the assembly, and they say, um, granted that the husband of Nindada, the daughter of Luninurta, had been killed, but what had the woman done that she should be killed? Okay, so even though her husband is killed, why should she be killed over it? Then the members of the assembly of Nippur faced them and said, okay, so now, it's, now there's the, the decision. A woman, can, the, 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 um, the assumption, just a second, I see my camera has frozen yet again. The issue is that, the issue is that the, that she heard, she, they told her that they killed her husband and she didn't say anything.
So the question is, is she guilty of murder or not? All right. So what the assembly is going to do is going to say why she would, why she would possibly stay quiet and yet not be guilty of murder. Okay. Um, so what they say is, um, they say, so the, then the members of the assembly of Nippur, them. so here are the two, two small groups kind of made their argument that the members of the assembly of Nippur faced them and said, a woman whose husband did not support her, granted that she knew her husband's enemies and that after her husband had been killed, she heard that her husband had been killed. Why should she not remain silent about him? Is it she who killed her husband? The punishment of those who actually killed should suffice. In accordance with the decision of the assembly of Nippur, Nanasig, the son of Lusin, Ku Enlil, the son of Kunana, the barber, and Enlil and Nam, the slave Adakat of Adakala, the gardener, were handed over to the executioner to be killed. This is a case taken up by the assembly of Nippur. So what they said was, look, maybe her, she didn't like her husband that much. That doesn't mean she killed him. Maybe she didn't like her husband. They killed him. They told her they killed him. She didn't like him, so she didn't say anything. That doesn't mean she killed him. Right. And so here you have okay reasoning. You know, they're saying, look, there's just no reason to say she killed him. We have the three people we know killed him. There's no reason to say that she killed him. There's no reason to kill her along with them. And let's not do that. Okay. So you can see that there is, you know, again, th there is a desire in general to get to the correct, to a correct decision and a reasonable decision. Right. Now, this setup of different groups arguing a central case to a group of, to kind of an audience, and then having, and then coming to a conclusion based on reasoning is something that we should all be familiar with from whose trial? Yirmiyahu, right? Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu's trial. Let's take a look at Yirmiyahu's trial because the setup is a similar one, even though it's much lengthier. Okay, so let's take a look at how a trial actually works, how a trial is described as working. And it will see a lot of parallels in the way in the way it, it's set up. In other words, in terms of different arguments, who's arguing in front of whom, and who's making the decision. So again, not the king, right? So let's take a look at um, at we're going to look at uh, Yirmiyahu. Okay, so Jeremiah, and that is um, Parakhafav, chapter twenty six. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so I'm reading from, I'm reading from Zion from verse 7. Does everyone have it? I'll wait a little while for people to get it. Okay. So what happened is he is, um, actually, I'll, I'll just go back a little bit. What there, what is happening is he has a prophecy and the prophecy says, uh, it, it finishes where the verse right before this is I'm going to make this house, namely the temple, we're going to make it like Shiloh. In other words, it's going to be completely destroyed. And this city is going to be a curse for all the nations of the earth. In other words, the, the, the temple and the city are going to be destroyed. That is the prophecy. The, the prophets and all the nations heard Yirmiyahu, heard Jeremiah, or just go call me Yirmiyahu, heard him saying these things in the temple of God. So when Yirmiyahu wished to say these things, uh, the priests and the prophets um, and all and the whole nation caught him saying, you shall surely die. Why? What has he done that deserves death? Why did you prophesy in the name of God, saying this house will be like Shiloh, and this city will be destroyed without a settler, and all the nation gather to Yirmiyahu in the house of God? In other words, they're also getting for court case. What is the... Um, what is the um, um, accusation? It's not simply, um, it's not, there are, are there are other places where you see uh, cases of treason being brought against a prophet. Here it's not a case of treason. Here it's a case of false prophecy. And we'll see even more clearly that this is, this is a case of false prophecy as the trial con uh, continues. In other words, just the fact that you're saying that this house is going to be destroyed is clearly a false prophecy that makes you deserving of death. 
Okay, so they all get ready for court case. Everyone gathers. Okay, so the officers of Yehuda heard these things. They go up from the house of the king and from to the temple, and they sit in the opening of the gate of, of the new gate of God, right? The gate of the Lord. That sitting in the gate means now there's a trial, right? We saw this before. You sit in the gate, that's where you have trials. Uh, and now we're going to have a similar situation where you have different groups arguing the case. All right. So the priests and the prophets are the ones who are going to be arguing um, against me to the officers and to the whole nation, saying, the, This man deserves a judgment of death because he, he prophesied about the city just as you heard in your ear, you heard with your own ears. And so here he says, here you've got the evidence, right? You heard what the guy said. He deserves death. Um, so Yirmiyahu says to the officers of the whole nation, saying, the Lord sent me. Now, this is, why is this a why is this defense? It would be a defense, frankly, against either. It would be a defense against the treason thing, saying, look, I'm just being sent by God. Here it's saying, I am, in fact, a true prophet, right? Um, uh, God sent me to prophesy about this house and about the city, all these things that you heard. And now, improve your ways and your deeds and listen to the Lord, of to the voice of the Lord your God and God will um, will kind of change his mind about this evil that essentially he's planning to do to you um, so in other words there's a way back now Yirmiyahu is the first prophet uh, and he does this um, elsewhere who sets up the rules of false prophecy in a different way than what we learn in Devarim and Deuteronomy right in Devarim how do you know a false prophet who remember First, how you was a false prophet. If you prophesy something and doesn't come true, that's a false prophet. A guy who prophesies something and doesn't doesn't come true, that's it. He's a false prophet. He's dead. Okay. Uh, Yirmiyahu says to a competing prophet who's saying that good things are going to happen and that you're going to break the yoke of, of Babylonia from the neck of Yehuda of Judah or Judea. He says to him, "You know that you're kind of putting yourself in danger here because if you prophesy good things." and don't happen, then you're a false prophet. But if you prophesy bad things and they don't happen, it just means that God had mercy and didn't do the bad thing. And you're prophesying a good thing and it's not going to happen and you're going to be a false prophet, right? So Yirmiyahu was the first person to vocalize what we have come, you know, in, in the Jewish you know, tradition has come to be the standard rule of false prophecy. That a prophet, a prophet who says bad things are going to happen can essentially never be ruled a false prophet because maybe God you know, changed his mind and had mercy, whereas a prophet says good things are going to happen, they don't happen, that is a false prophet. But that is the first time we hear that is from Yirmiyahu. In, in, in Dvarim and Deuteronomy, it just sounds like any bad, anything that's not happening, it could, it could uh, rule someone a false prophet. So here, so here we say, he says, look, um, told me to say this. If um, if you guys improve, then it won't happen. So don't bring me to trial. Improve what you're doing, right? So, um, and, but he's, he continues and says, um, um, he said, continues, and I'm reading from verse Yud Gimel 13. Uh, no, sorry, you dalid 14. And I, behold, I'm in your hands. Asuli do to me as is good and upright in your eyes, right? Do the right thing. But you should still know if you kill me, you've got innocent blood on you and on the city and on its inhabitants. Because God really did send me to you. To speak in your ears all these things, right? So, uh, yeah, do whatever you want. Just know that if you kill me, you're killing an innocent man and you're going to end up paying. Now, look, 
So the priests in the office presented their case, which is this guy deserves death. And Yermiao says, I don't deserve death because I am speaking a prophecy from God. And then the response of the officers and the nation is, um, this person does not get a judgment of death because he spoke to us in the name of the Lord our God. And now we're going to have a, a, a kind of bolstering of this opinion that he doesn't deserve a judgment of death um, from precedent, based on precedent. All right. Uh, what is that precedent? Um, so the, the elders get up and they say what? Um, uh, from the elders of the land, and they say, and I'm meaning from uh, 17 and going into 18, they said to a whole um, uh, uh, assembly of the nation, say, Micha, whose book we have, by the way, and we have this prophecy in the book of Micha, um, he prophesied in the days of Chizkiyahu, the king of Yehuda. And he said to the whole nation of Yehuda, saying, Call my ship's vote, so said the Lord God, host rather. Tzion Sadet Teharesh, Yushalayim Iyimtiya, the Har Habayt Levamotyar. He said, Tzion uh, Zion is going to be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem is going to be humps. Hump, hump, like a, a, a mounds of, of, of ruins and the temple mount is going to be um, just just a wooded um, you know wasteland um, wooded, a wooded heights did Chizkiyahu the king of Yehuda and all of Yehuda kill him? Halo et Hashem but Chizkiyahu, the king, was a God-fearer. By Echalat Hashem, so he prayed to God. By Nechem Hashem al-Ra'ashir Diber Lehem. So God, God regretted, changed his mind regarding the evil that he was that he planned to do. Vanachnu osim rak dolal nafshatenu, and we are doing a great evil for our own souls. Okay, so what what they're saying is, look, here's Micha. And two things are two things happen. One is he said that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And second, was Jerusalem destroyed? No. And yet he wasn't a false prophet. He wasn't killed. So therefore, Yermiyahu could be saying this thing. It could even not come true. And he's not a false prophet. It's a call for prayer and repentance. Okay. Um, so here is a but here's a similar situation. You have different groups speaking up in this trial and a decision is reached and it's part in this case partially based on precedent um it's, it's really nice because we actually have here a quote of Micha in Yermiyahu which is fun um and uh, and we're going to talk later in this series we're going to talk about just how devastating the Assyrian conquest was for Yehuda for Judea and that's when Micha was speaking Micha was speaking when really it did look like Jerusalem was going to be destroyed so at any rate, here we see the way a trial really was. We see how it was working in in the Mesopotamia, and here we hear see in in a very similar situation, right? Where of how it's working in Yermiyahu. Now, now I do want to note that the trial we looked at in Nippur is a very early one. It's a Sumerian trial, so it's much earlier than this this trial of Yermiyahu, and yet we see that the setup is still quite similar. Um, so in terms of, so I, I wanted to kind of go, so we looked at different, the way you would shoot, you could, you could decide a trial. You could decide a trial um, through, usually through evidence, through witnesses, but you could also here have precedent. There's a certain amount of reasoning involved. It's not like you only, you, you blindly uh, do things. However, if you have physical evidence of something or you lack physical evidence or and witnesses in a case where you need them then that is going to determine a case let's take a look at another example a biblical example of where reasoning is used and where it's being brought as a uh, an example of kind of oh and by the way uh, at the end of this chapter of Yermiyahu, right um it talks about a another prophet who is also uh, prophesying bad, and he doesn't get away. He gets killed. So you're supposed, you're supposed to understand that even though this court case went great for Yermiyahu, it did it because he had God's help 
at any rate, because another guy who's doing a very similar thing doesn't survive. Um, so if we, but if we look at the story of Shlomo Hamelch, now we recently uh, actually read this the Shlomo the trial of Shlomo of Solomon the 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 of Solomon and the two prostitutes and the baby, right? Um, we read this. Um, we read this uh, Haftarah in Shul, in synagogue, in a very unusual situation because we almost never read the Haftarah. We read the Haftarah. It was Miketz that wasn't on Hanukkah. Miketz is almost always unread on Hanukkah. The one time it wasn't on, it's not on Hanukkah, we read it with this trial. This trial is the Haftarah. And so we enjoyed it this year. I think the next time we enjoy it is, I think, like 31 years from now. So, so... We kind of could kind of revel in it, but we, we honestly can always open it up and read it. So it's not such a big deal. Um, so if we're reading, if we're reading, um, I, I see puzzled looks on your faces. I'm not sure why. What, what, what's the, what's the puzzled look? Okay. <laughs> um, um, so let me see. Is there a, is there a, hold on. Let's see. Um, um, Okay, so if we so if we look at this is in Malachim Aleph, Parak Gimel, that's first Kings chapter three. Okay. And it's talking about how amazing Shlomo is, how amazing, amazing Solomon is. What's what's amazing about him is his wisdom. And why is his wisdom so amazing? And one of the things that's amazing about him is his wisdom. Why is his wisdom so amazing? And as a as an example, we get this court case. Um, so let's take a look at this court case. Uh, here we have, so I'm reading from verse 16, Ted Zion. So again, it's Malachim Aleph Gimel Tetzayin, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. Um, okay, so as tavona shtaim nashim zonot el hamelech v'tamod nalifanav. Then two prostitute women came to the king and they stood in front of him. Now it's interesting, this idea that you would have two prostitutes who can come to him. However, and we're going to look at this a little bit more soon, um, it is a standard, particularly if you look at the role of the king in Israel, like again, I said that throughout the ancient Near East, kings did sometimes get involved in fairly what's looked to us like fairly minor cases, depending on again the period and the place. Um, um, in in kings of Israel get involved in particular um, when it seems like justice would not be done if you just applied the law. Okay, that's what it seems to be. Seems to be kind of a rule. And here is a case where we're simply lacking evidence. Like, as we said before, this is a case there's just no way to know. So what do you do, right? Um, there's no witnesses. There's no evidence. So what are you going to do? So the two prostitute women, they come to the king. They stand before him. So you have this woman. She says, um, we're in the same house. And I gave birth to her. I gave birth with her in the house. So the third day after I gave birth, she also gave birth. But we are together, and there's no other stranger with us in the house. Only the two of us are in the house. Why is it important for us to know that no one else is in the house with them? No potential witnesses. There's no other witness you can call. Right, because that's the normal thing you would do. You say, "Okay, bring forth the other people in the in the house and to have them say what happened." There is no one else; it's just the two of us. Okay, um, and she's and this woman's this other woman's kid died because she slept on top of him. Um, by the way, they say mothers never do that unless they're like drugged. You know, they say it's it's uh, you know, but uh, at any rate. Um, and she got up in the middle of the night and she took my child. And your maid servant was sleeping. She put this baby in her bosom. And she took her dead kid and she put it in my bosom. And I got up in the morning to breastfeed my child and here it was dead. Um, and I looked at him in the morning and it wasn't the baby I gave it wasn't the son I gave birth to and the other woman says no 
my child's alive, my son's alive, and your son's dead. And the one says, no, your son's dead and my son's alive. But to the and they both spoke in front of the king. So they're each one just, it's a, she said, she said situation that you can't get out of. What are you going to do? Right? Um, now, in the way a Russian court case would work, you either have to have evidence, you have to have witnesses, or you have to have some reasoning from the current case. In this case, there is none of the above. There are no witnesses. There's no physical evidence because these are just two prostitutes who gave birth at home. And there's um, and there's no witness because there's no one else in the house with them. And there's nothing to reason with. So what's going to happen? We all know what's going to happen, but let's talk about it. Okay. So, um, so the king says, this one says her way and that one says her way. He said, bring me a sword. They bring the sword to the king. He said, split the live child in two. And he said, give a half to each one of them. And the woman whose son whose son was alive uh, um, said to the king, because her 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 mercy was raised on her son, she said, Please, please, sir, please, my lord, give give her the, the living child. Just don't kill him. merit. And the other one says, Gamli Neither of us will have it. Chop him up, chop him up, right? And the king said, give her the king said, Give her the living child and do not kill him. She is his mother. Okay. So what's amazing about this court case? The king created evidence. The king understood how people think and created a situation that would reveal the true mother. All right. That's wisdom from within wisdom. That's amazing wisdom. And it got him out of a situation where you would normally never be able to decide something. Okay. That is the height of wisdom. All right. To understand the situ what, what a situation to put them in that is going to determine who the true mother is. Um, and also, of course, it makes for very good reading. I mean, you really hate that mother who says, yeah, chop, and neither of us will have them. You're like, yeah. Right. But it, it's, um, um, so you have, but you have this idea of that is that is true wisdom, and you would, and and also kind of exemplifies what you would not normally not be able to expect in an ancient court case. You wouldn't be able to expect a situation like this where there's simply no evidence, no way, and there's no compromise, right? Normally, as we saw, you might want to try a compromise, and what, that's one of the clever things that Shlomo is doing is it's almost a compromise, right? It it makes it sound like it's something that you could do, right? So they'll believe it. Right, but no, no, that's not what he's going to do. He would never do that, and so this is the way he to find the mother. So let's look at some other situations because I've talked about what the role of the king is, particularly in biblically, particularly in the Israelite kingdom. When does the king get involved? So here we have a case where, I mean, on the one hand, it's also showing Shlomo's Solomon's wisdom, but it's also a, a case where who can decide this, right? So they're bringing it to the king. Um, let's take another look. Let, let's take a look at another. This is a classic example. It's not a real case, right? But it's the um, the woman, the wise woman of Tekoa, okay? Um, so I'm reading from Shmuel Bet Yudalit. That's 2 Samuel chapter 14. Um, that I'm reading from... Verse four. Now, what, what's the background? The background is that David is not talking to Absalom. He's essentially exiled Absalom, right? Why? Because Absalom killed Amnon. Why? Because Amnon raped Tamar, right? So there's this whole chain of things in the whole Davidic saga, right? Which all starts with David's, by the way, I'm just, this is an aside, right? But it starts with David's sin against, against um, Uriah and, and against Uriah that he, he both he both has an affair with his wife and gets Uria killed, right? As punishment, his house is going to destroy itself from the inside because he did something against the whole, he just betrayed everything. His family is going to destroy itself from the inside and it's already started happening. Amnon raped Tamar. Amnon's the crown prince. He raped Tamar. Avshalom is Tamar's full brother, not half brother like Amnon is. He takes her in and he 
is gets revenge on Amnon, so he killed Amnon. Now Absalom's the next in line for the throne. Uh, David has has exiled him, um, essentially, and Yoab wants him to take him back. Okay, um, and so he gets wise woman to Koa, and this wise woman from Tekoa comes said says Vatomar Ishat Koit. In uh, I'm reading from verse four from Pasuk Dalit. Um, so she, 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 she bows down and she says, save, save me, king, right? May the king save. He says, the king asked her, what's going on? She said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a, a widow. My husband died. And I, your, your mate, your, your servant has Two sons, they two of them they fought in the field. There was, so there was no because they were in the field, there was no one to save one from the other. And one of them smote the other and killed him. So now the whole family, her whole extended family, because you have Goel Adam, right? You have, there's a person who's supposed to kill him as the next relative over, right? So they're saying, give over the son who killed the other one and we'll kill him for, the, for his brother that he killed. And they're going to kill, they're going to destroy my one, the one heir. And they're going to put out my, the, my flame that still remains so that there will be nothing left of my husband, no name or remainder on the face of the earth. Okay, so what's the situation here? A crime has been done. The normal, the normal punishment for her crime of murder is death, period. Right? That, that's a standard thing. She's not saying my, she's not saying my son is innocent. Her, I have one son. She says, I have one son. Killed the other son. Killed my other son. But he's all I've got left. If they kill this one, my husband has no, there's no one to remain. No one to remain of me. No one to remain of my husband. What did I do? It's not what she's not saying, but that's what's true, right? What did I do? What did my husband do? We did nothing. And they will now kill the only one that remains. Okay. So this is a case where it's very clear what the, what the outcome should be. And yet she's going to the king and saying, but this is not justice. This will harm me irreparably and it's not fair. It's not right. It says, go, go home and I will command regarding you. She said, she said, "Let the sin be on me." In other words, if you if you if you clear him, I'll take responsibility. Your 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 throne is is clear of any of any guilt. He said, "Don't don't 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 worry. Bring to me. No one's going to touch you." He said, remember God, don't let the blood redeemer kill him, right? You'll destroy my son. He says, as God lives, your, your, not a hair of your, 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 of your son's head will fall to the ground. In other words, I am taking it on myself. Your son is protected, right? As if I'm doing this for you. Right, and then of course she turns around and says, "Well, what about your own son that you exiled for killing your other son?" Right, so that that's that's the that's the whole play. It's none of it. None of this is a real trial. And he's like, "Oh, Yoav sent you, huh?" All right, because because uh, Yoav's always getting involved, <laughs> and and that this whole case was in order to point out to David that he should bring Absalom back, even though he killed his other son. Anna. Okay, um, in order to do this, you have a court case where there would be an injustice, quote unquote, done by simply uh, carrying out the law. And we have a similar situation, excuse me, we have a similar situation um, when uh, David is first accused of what he's done against, against Uriah. When, they, when uh, Natan comes and tells him the story about the man who has a little baby lamb that he loves so much, and da da da, and you know, and 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 David's like, oh yeah, kill the guy who took that lamb and killed it, right? Because because in this case, it's so evil what this person has done, he should have a much harsher 
punishment. And then he's like, yeah, but that's you, right? So, so it, 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 two cases where, um, but two cases that need to be realistic enough for the king to say, yeah, it makes sense that you would bring this court in this case to me. Because if you just had the regular, regular legal ruling, justice would not be done, right? And that's why you bring it to the king. So, um, and just if we're already talking about Avshalom, uh, if you look at uh, Shmuel Bet Perk Tetvava, second, second Samuel 15, right? Uh, verse two, Pasuk Bet. Uh, this is when Avshalom is trying to kind of take over the kingdom. Okay. Uh, remember, he's now next after Amnon's dead, so he's next in line for the throne. Vishkim Avshalom Vamad al Yad Derech Hashar. So um, Avshalom got woke up and he stood on the way to the gate. And remember, when we say gate means court cases. Gate means trials, right? But he called Isha Sher Yelo Riv Lavo El Hamel Chamishpat. Anyone who had a legal case to come before the king in just just in justice by cra Absalom love and Absalom will call to him by Yomer Amy Zat Yirata what what city are you from? By Yomer Mea Khachif to Israel Abdecha. They said from such and such a tribe of Israel is your servant. By Yomer love Absalom and Absalom will say, Re'ed Varecha Tobim and Unichokin. Your what you're arguing is right, right? Bishomea and the Khameta Melch, but no one's listening on the king's side. Who will make me, Absalom says, who will make me judge over the land? And to me, any man will come who has a who has a court case, and I will find in his favor. So he is taking the role of judge, right? Which in so in uh, in Israel, as in many other places, but the king is considered a judge of the land. And one of the arguments that Absalom is making to people is, is appoint me a king, appoint me king, because I will do justice. And what is justice? Of course, it's finding in your favor, right? So if, if I'm king, you, you know, I know you, you know me, um, I will find in your favor. Okay, so here we see um, the role of the role of a king. The role of a king is both to deal with um, to deal with cases that have no other that don't have a clear solution, and also to deal with cases. Uh, and this is particular. This is more particular to in 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 to Israel, or at least in biblical stories, that to um, rule in cases where if you simply applied the law, justice would not be done, and then it makes sense to bring it to the king. Um, in um, we have a few more minutes, so I would like to look at another interesting parallel. This is a little bit less about trial law and a little bit more about how um, how things uh, how kind of contracts are, are set up or, or how agreements are set up because there's a very clear parallel between Avraham buying um, land the land for for Marat Machpelah where Sarah is going to be um, buried and a case I, I have it for you here. Uh, in your handout, um, this is, let me take a look, um, this is on, I believe, um, just a second, let me find the right, the right one, hold on for a moment. Please. I need to I need to remember which which this was was it hold on Yes okay this is if you look on page the bottom of page 4 of your handout this is page 270 is that right? No, 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 no. My, my, my bad. It's page 272. It's page four of your handout, page 272 of the Context of Scripture, volume three, uh, but page four in your handout, okay? And this is, this is a very straightforward um, case of a, an agreement um, with, of, of an adoption, a quote-unquote, right? Um, so, uh, if you look, and you can actually see it in the in the middle column, 
it gives you kind of the the parallels and they're structural parallels they're not really linguistic parallels or they're a little bit linguistic they're structural parallels to the agreement that Avram comes to when he buys the plot of land for Marat HaMachpelah so let's turn to uh, to uh, Genesis 23 to Breshit Chaf Gimel starting with Pasuk um, um, Tedvav verse 15 Okay, um, and you can actually see, I and mean, it, it gives it to you right there, right? So if we look at, excuse me, if we look at um, the the text, it says it starts with Shamash Utzer, descendant of Tzila and Kidiniti. His wife spoke thus to Ninurta Idin and Lubelti. Akaiti, your daughter, give me. Let her be my daughter. So in 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 Pasuk Tetvav in verse fifteen, um, um, Adonish Ma'eni. Uh, sir, hear me. Eretz, Eretz shekel kesef mahi bet kavor. And uh, this is the agreement. The agreement is, um, give me four hundred. You know what? What is four hundred uh, pieces of you know shekels of silver between me and you, and and bury your 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 dead person. Now, I do want to say here that it is not quite a complete parallel. It's very clearly here, kind of making fun or or putting in kind of a sarcastic, mocking way the fact that this guy pretended that he was going to give it to him, and now he's asking for this exorbitant amount of money, right? It's like, what is 400 shekels of silver between me and you? It's very clear it's not, it's not a straight, you know, contract, right? It's, it's meant, you're meant to kind of notice that this is kind of, this is a little bit disingenuous. Um, and, uh, but here it's first setting out, okay, this is the, this is the, um, um, this is the exchange, the exchange it's 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 400 shekels of silver and then you can bury your dead person and Avram listened to Ephron and he and he measured out for Ephron the silver that he spoke of in the in the ears of the sons of Chet. And this is important because the idea is that you have witnesses, right? And if you look on the in the in the parallel, afterwards Ninurta Idin listened to him and gave his daughter Akaditi in adoption to Shamash Utur. In other words, I, he listened and he did it, right? So that is actually quite parallel. Avram listened and that is what he did. Okay. And then that's a, that's the agreement. Okay. Um um, so this is what he gave. He gives Arba me ochekel kesef of Elisa He gave him the 400, uh, 400 shekels of silver. All right. And then um, if we if we uh, read on here. And so what is the agreement? Where I'm reading back in the back in the uh, in the uh, Mesopotamian parallel. Uh, wherever Akaditi goes, she is our daughter. At such time as the family of the house of Shamash Utsur should come forward with a claim, and do not say to Akari as follows: You are a maidservant, Ak Ak Akaditi. Sorry, Akaditi. Um, Akaiti is a free woman, literally a daughter of Nippur. No one shall have any authority over her, nor shall he return X minas of silver. And that's the that is the um, um, the final uh, the final verses here uh, in um, um, seventeen to eighteen. But yet come stay a frown asher b'machpelah asher lufnei mamre hasadeh b'marah asher bo v'chol eitz asher b'sadeh asher b'chol gulos aviv. And he established the field of a frown, which is in the machpelah. That which is before Mamre, the field and the cave which is in it, and all the trees that are in the field, which are all in its border around, right, and its boundary around. It's Avraham's as a purchase before the eyes of the sons of Chet. In other words, and there you have the witnesses, right? You finish with these are the witnesses, these are the people who witnessed the agreement. According to all who can come. To the gate of the city. So everyone witnessed the purchase. So this agreement this is actually saying, this verse is not just a verse telling us, this verse is saying, this was an official agreement. This is what the agreement included. This is, it was, it was in steps. He said, give me 400 uh, shekels of silver. This Avram did it in front of witnesses. Now this agreement includes the field. It includes the trees. It includes the cave. And this was settled in front of all the children of Chet. And the, the um and we can see here how important it is that to state that this it's it, what the central thing when we see when we see the parallels between this biblical text and an ancient kind of um um witnessed contract as it were 
we see that what the emphasis is here in this text is to give us a witness contract. In other words, not only is this telling a story, this is something we're supposed to be able to point to and say, see, he purchased it. He owns it. This is what the contract included, all right? That is actually what the story wants to convey. And it's not just us reading into it, right? So that's, what, that's one of the things that we can get when we see these kind of strong parallels. So um, um, I'd like to uh, conclude now. Now is the time to write in any questions or comments. I know we jumped around a lot, but let's go try and kind of wrap it all in a in a bow. All right. So what we looked, what we saw was on the on the ancient Near Eastern side, we saw that on the one hand there are use of things like um, the the river trial when you can't decide. You you need either there are. You try to rely on physical evidence. You try to rely on personal witnesses. If there's a he said, he said situation, it's usually he said, he said, right? Because it could say he said, she said. So sometimes, at least in old Babylonian rules, you can bring in the river trial, right? In the biblical thing, we only have something similar, specifically with an adulterous wife, right? Specifically because it probably needs some kind of conclusion and some kind of, um, um, there has to be some kind of acceptance there. Um, that's the only place where we we really see we really see it in the in the biblical text um, or anything similar, I should say. Um, um, and but we also see reasoning. There is a certain amount of reasoning that goes on even in Mesopotamian trials where they try to look beyond. They try to say, but why would she is she really guilty of murder? In other words, there's a lot uh, and there's a lot that goes on. By the way way beyond the law codes. When you read these trials, you see what they're considering, what they're thinking about. None of this is mentioned in the law codes because the law code, a written law code is usually not going to cover all of these different uh, shades. And there, but there are ideas that are behind it. We saw that there's a similar structure to a trial when we looked at Yirmiyahu in terms of two groups arguing back and forth and then the assembly kind of deciding Right in the, in the trial of Yirmiyahu, we saw that they're also using a precedent of a previous prophet to decide in Yirmiyahu's favor. Um, we also saw um, that with Sh with Shlomo with Solomon, his wisdom involves being able to create evidence in the absence of evidence. Right, his his deep knowledge of people allows him to create a situation that helps us decide a case when there's simply no way to decide. There's no evidence, there's no witnesses, there's no way to compromise. And yet he creates a situation which allows a, a, a rule. And we also, and we saw that the role of the king, particularly in Israel, is a little bit different than at least what we know of in the ancient Greece. While it also includes very similar things in terms of ruling in different cases it, uh, and cases where it's not clear what the ruling should be, it also includes an idea of when justice would not be served by simply applying the law. Finally, we saw that when we see a certain parallel, a very strong structural parallel between a biblical story and an ancient, an ancient illegal contract, it's telling us something also about what the story is trying to convey that's trying to convey something with actual kind of legal impact. Anyway, I was, I'm glad that you joined me for this class. Um, I, I think that, I hope that this kind of uh, rounded out your view of law in the ancient Near East and kind of biblical law, like actual active trial biblical law, as it were. Um, I'll pause a little bit to see if you have any questions or comments and, uh, and have a, Good evening, everyone. I'm going to wait a few minutes, though. No, nope, nothing? Well, thank you for joining me. Um, I think next, um, um, and have a good evening. I think next week what I'd like to do is look a bit about, um, look at war. Um, how wars, the, the kind of the morality, the war, morality at war in the Bible and in ancient Near East, so particularly Assyria. We have a lot of stuff. Excuse me. We don't have much from Babylonia. We have a lot from Assyria on on how they carried out battles, right? Um, and what was considered appropriate behavior when fighting. So uh, we're going to. So I'll, I'll take a look at that. And and I would perhaps after that, I, I think I'd like to look a little bit more in terms of historically and and look at how the Assyrian conquest and Babylonian conquest worked within the way the Assyrian and Babylonian, the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. Work because a lot of times we look at the conquests kind of outside of history, and in fact, the way um, the way Assyria, the Assyrian Empire proceeded 
with Israel. And the way the Babylonian empire proceeded was very typical of how they treated vassal states in general. So I think, uh, I think that would be worth uh, looking at. Um, just a pause, I just see that there are some comments. Kramer case. This is like so many detective shows where the investigator becomes suspicious of the non-grieving spouse. Yeah, that that one with the with the nipper, the nipper uh, murder case. Yes, right. Like why? Yeah, but he's dead, and you didn't say anything. And uh, but it's it's nice to see that they didn't just just make her, you know, dr you know, you know, just just kill her without evidence. Um, in the U.S., in civil litigation, typically parties settle when on the eve of court. Yes, but it looks like here that they that there wasn't there wasn't that because you might as well just go to court. Um, I think, I, but who knows? You know, honestly, we wouldn't. I don't think we would know if they settle out of court. We might sit, call that just a contract. We might see that as just a contract if they're settling out of court. Like they might write up a contract and say, we do have that, for example, in Newsy, we have an agreement where he says, I will not bring cases again. He's gonna pay me this and I will never dispute his, his claim. So that could be an example of settling out of court. That might be a situation where uh, instead of going to court, simply reached a contractual agreement where one where where the, where the brother agreed, I will, or as I don't remember, it's the brother or the son agreed, I will never contest your claim. Um, yeah, the earlier case I signed with the split, that split was after going to court. That was very much like in Israel. In Israel, a lot of times when you go to court, the court will be like, guys, compromise. Each of you give a little. And it, it can be frustrating for people going to court who want it to be decided in one person's favor. They're like, but I'm right. And the court's like, yeah, forget it. You just compromise. <laughs> it's, 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 it's typical of the Israeli court system. And that's why that reminded me of that, where you actually go to court and the court's like, yeah, we have no idea, just compromise, right? So that, that, was, that was like that. Um, but there are cases, there are contracts that look like maybe you could compare it to settling out of court. Could litigants have surrogates for the reward deal? I think I read they could. I think I read that you could have a surrogate for the reward deal. Um, I have to. I have to read up on it. I assume not in every case. I think I read that you could have a surrogate for it. Um, you also is it's one of the reasons. One of the times you would call in the king is if someone who seems guilty, who's judged guilty, survived the river ordeal. Now what do we do? And they bring in the king to decide. Now what do we do? We said he was guilty. He was supposed to go through the river ordeal, and he survived. Now what? So, so that's a specific case where you have a reward deal because he's actually considered guilty, which is also a little bit different from the cases we looked at. Um, but anyway, so, so thank you for joining me, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everyone.